All right, uh, maybe we can get started. Um, so we're really, really delighted uh, to have him uh, uh, not only give a talk this morning, but also um, give a talk on a fascinating subject uh, this afternoon. Uh, I remember once uh, having a, a conversation about amplitude with the Edward, where he uh, complained that the problem with amplitudes is they have too many properties. <laughs> Uh, and uh, I think Lance will not be reducing the number of properties of amplitudes in this talk, but I think it'll be a, a non reduction in an interesting way. So take it away, Lance. Thanks a lot, Mima. It's been a real pleasure to be here for this conference you've organized and visit the Institute again. And uh, yeah, when you abuse somebody for two talks in one day, there's a risk of there's little pieces that overlap here and there, but I hope you'll forgive me for that. Um, the talk I wanted to, what I want to talk to you about today was some work that I've done with Omer Gertigan and Andrew McLeod and Matthias Wilhelm in a couple of papers that uh, came out uh, last December and uh, just a few days ago. And uh, what it's about in a nutshell, we calculated the six gluon scattering amplitude in maximally supersymmetric gauge theory in the large M limit to seven loops a few years ago. And then more recently, we realized we could calculate a form factor for three gluons and a stress energy tensor <coughs> eight loops. And then we were looking at the two answers and we discovered somehow that they were almost the same. In fact, uh, except they were sort of written backwards. So I have to tell you a little bit about uh, how we uh, uh, write them backwards and what this map means, but we really don't have a great physical understanding of what's going on. And uh, so maybe you, the audience, will figure out the physical reasons underlying this. But anyway, I want to tell you about this kind of uh, interesting map. Um, before doing that, I just want to give a little bit of motivation um, for why I'm studying scattering amplitudes in this theory. And it's to try to give some insight into the general properties of scattering amplitudes of relativistic gauge theories, in part to improve our knowledge of the theory of what happens at the LHC so that we can test uh, <coughs> the relations between experiment and theory, the high orders and the strong coupling constant. And uh, the LHC is a QCD machine, collides quarks and gluons, makes huge numbers of jets, the Higgs boson, Higgs boson every now and then, and so on. Just as an example of things that uh, play a role in uh, calculating the, uh, if you wanna know the production of the Higgs boson, at the LHC, the dominant production, production mechanism is kind of ironically gluon fusion to Higgs. It's ironic because the Higgs doesn't talk directly to the uh, gluons being an uncolored particle, but nevertheless, through the exchange virtual production of a top quark in the loop, the two gluons can uh, couple to the Higgs. This is the uh, leading order Feynman diagram. If you evaluate this and square it, you get the leading order cross section. Now you can get an excellent approximation by take, taking the mass of the top quark to infinity because twice the mass of the top, which is sort of where cuts would start to open up here, is way up at 350 GeV and the Higgs mass is only 125 GeV. So you can expand in the ratio of M Higgs over M top squared and you get a pretty good uh, approximation, which you can also correct. Anyway, at this leading order, you integrate out the top quark and you just get a, a single dimension five local operator coupling the Higgs to the product of two gluon field strengths. And that's what uh, makes up the bulk of the uh, corrections. And people have gone, not just from this leading order approximation, not just next to leading order, not just next to next to leading order, but all the way to N cubed LO and working out the uh, short distance cross section for producing a Higgs inclusively in gluon fusion at the LHC. 
And the reason they've done this is because it's necessary to get enough precision to compete with experimental measurements of the Higgs boson now and in the uh, future uh, LHC running where much more luminosity will be collected and better statistics. <coughs> if you look at this plot over here, it shows the Higgs production cross-section as a function of the LHC energy. And the LHC is run between seven TeV for a short time and eight, almost up to 14. And the cross-section obviously gets bigger as you increase the energy because you have more gluons that you have enough energy to fuse to form the Higgs. But what you can also see here is that this, this curve here is the leading order curve. This is the next to leading order curve, next to next to leading order curve. And finally, the N cubed LO curve, which was the result of the calculation about five or six years ago by Anastasio, Durer, Dulat, Herzog, and Mis Mitzelberger. And uh, finally, the, the uh, error bands start to become smaller. They're, they're uh, estimated by varying some artificial scales in the calculation, the renormalization and factorization scale. But if you had just stopped at leading order, you would have had a really terrible approximation. The final answer is almost two or three times bigger than the leading order result. And only by the time you get to NNLO do things start to stabilize. And then the N cubed LO one is at the same order. So I'm worried that the error bar of the leading order term was too small? Well, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just a prescription for estimating the error, and it's uh, obviously a very bad estimate. Why it's so bad. But uh, the leading order one somehow doesn't know that there are large corrections that are about to develop. Um, this is one of the worst behaved series for collider cross sections. And it has uh, large uh, Sudikoff logarithms. In other words, there's a big mismatch between uh, the leading order kinematics, and which, which is uh, the gluons are very fast falling in the proton. And normally you cancel virtual of divergences with real divergences, but they're in a little bit different region here because the real emission forces you to have more energy. And there are very few gluons with a little bit more energy because the parton distributions are falling so fast. So there's a big uh, correction there. And uh, the leading order physics doesn't really know about that. And that's probably why it underestimates it. Any other questions? So you can sort of see that here, in fact. When you go to next to leading order, there are two types of corrections you have to compute. There are virtual corrections where you exchange a gluon between the two incoming gluons. And that's a one loop amplitude, which gets interfered with the tree amplitude to give the virtual corrections. But you can also radiate this uh, real gluon into the final state. And what I was saying earlier is that this invariant mass is exactly at the Higgs mass, whereas this is somewhat higher and it's uh, smeared in a distribution. But when you combine these two, you cancel the divergences, but there's a residual sensitivity, uh, which is like a singular plus distribution in the, in the kinematic variable that represents the uh, partonic center of mass energy. And that leads to a very large correction. And those corrections keep happening at higher orders as well, but they're not as pronounced. So if you want to go all the way to the state of the art, this is more like what you have to add up. Instead of just having one loop corrections, you need three loop virtual corrections. These were actually known quite a while ago and you don't have to do any phase space integration. It's rather trivial because there's just one Higgs in the final state. But you also need to include <coughs> contributions with more legs and fewer loops. So the two loop uh, glue glue to Higgs glue uh, one loop glue glue to Higgs glue glue and tree level Higgs plus three gluons. And uh, all of these other guys, if you want the total cross section, you should integrate over the whole phase space, which is very tricky to do. And these just show the, the gluonic contributions. There are plenty of other contributions where quark lines are running around here and in loops and so on. Plus you have to renormalize this operator represented by the 
uh, it, there are gluonic corrections to the strength of this operator as well, and, and other QCD corrections. Plus, you have to include these higher order terms in one gram top squared involving other operators, although they're relatively small. You have to convolute this with the probability of finding the gluons and other partons in the initial state. And uh, all that work is done to get the final cross section. Oh, I'm sorry. So, so uh, in, in all these pictures, you're just uh, are you okay? Yeah. Uh, Fortunately. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. Uh, just pre uh, 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 treating the the glue glue hit the contact operator here. Yeah. yeah this uh, this contribution here, I believe, was all computed with just the contact level. There are also electroweak corrections, and there were separate papers that were combining the electroweak corrections, the higher order one over M top squared and so on to sort of get the final answer. But the bulk of the stability or improvement in the precision comes from the pure QCD corrections to the uh, leading operator. So yeah, you have to include all of those. So for this talk, the main point is that one of the ingredients that you need to do this or to do other kinds of calculations are these are scattering amplitudes. They're the underlying uh, building blocks. In particular, while some of these other ingredients are close to, or in most cases can go to higher orders, this case is uh, only known at two loops. It's probably close to the case, close to the point of being known at three loops, but not quite, it's getting close. And uh, so there's a premium placed you want to go to high precision of understanding these multi loop scattering amplitudes for often relatively large numbers of, of final state particles. And, uh, but what I'm also interested in is uh, not just calculating the scattering amplitudes for their own sake for QCD, but trying to compute higher orders so that we can look at them and find new patterns or principles. And we can maybe use those patterns to invent better algorithms and go to yet higher orders and so on in what was called uh, by John Joseph Carrasco, a virtuous circle. Now, one of the problems is that with loop integrands is that you have to integrate them. And the multi-loop, multi-scale integrals are typically very difficult to evaluate. If you go to one loop, there is a very nice result that because we live in or near four dimensions, all the one loop integrals that we need for phenomenology can be reduced to scalar box integral integrals plus simpler. In other words, if you have five external particles attached to your loop, you might think you have a Pentagon integral, but you don't actually, you can, you can write, rewrite the Pentagon integral as a linear combination of box integrals. And the hexagon integrals can be rewritten as combinations of box integrals and the heptagon integrals and so on. So at the end of the day, all you have to do is evaluate scalar box integrals. And uh, that was done in some form in dimensional regularization by a Tuft and Beltman. And there were a number of other contributions. And, and basically these uh, <coughs> poly logarithms, or the di logarithm is the only special function other than the logarithm that you need for these scalar box integrals. So the space of special functions that you need is quite limited. But as soon as you go to higher loops, you get a much uh, bigger can of worms. Um, there's been some recent work by uh, Hofi here and Andrew McLeod, Matt Schwartz and Christian Virgo on the fact that if you have at least polylogarithmic uh, functions with symbols that you can uh, show that uh, <coughs> you get at most uh, two L integrations in the special functions at L loop orders. And these can be called weight two L iterated integrals or generalized poly logarithms in some cases. In other cases, you get more complicated functions called elliptic poly logarithms. And uh, it's, a, it's a real challenge to understand all the mathematical complications of the processes of the integrals you need for specific processes in some cases. And uh, so what we're gonna do in this talk instead is look at a case where we do get polylogarithms, but a relatively limited class of them. And that will allow us to, to go to high loop orders and investigate some of the properties there. 
So we're going to turn away from turn our back on QCD right now and go to its maximally supersymmetric cousin, which is n equals four super Yang Mills theory. And we're also going to work in the large n or uh, planar limit where the gauge group is SUNC with NC goes to infinity. Now, in general, amplitudes being kinematic functions of the variables can kind of be divided up into rational dependence on the kinematic variables and transcendental functions. Although in general, you might have a very complicated combination of these. In the case of planar n equals four, the rational structure sort of mimics what happens at tree level, especially if you represent the tree amplitudes using BCFW recursion relations. The structures you see there, those rational structures, you basically just have to multiply them by different transcendental functions. And so here we're gonna focus on just those transcendental functions. Also, this theory is very special. As we've known for a long time, it's the archetype for the ADS CFT correspondence. And so it's related to uh, strings propagating in anti de Sitter space. And closely related to that, it was discovered that amplitudes in this theory are dual to Wilson loops for closed light like polygons. And then finally, we seem to see a new duality cropping up between amplitudes, uh, for example, the six gluon amplitude and form factors, the three gluon form factor. Although how general this one is and what it means remains to be seen, but that's what I'm trying to build up to in this talk. So uh, many of you know this already, but uh, QCD and N equals four super Yang mills are, are uh, closely connected in perturbation theory. They both have gluons, which have identical self interactions among themselves, but the quarks in the fundamental representation of QCD are replaced by adjoint gluinos, four of them. And there are also, and the double line here indicates the adjoint color compared to the fundamental color here. And there are also adjoint scalars, which also interact through uh, Yukawa couplings. And of course, all the particles are in the same multiple. And at tree level, the gluon scattering amplitudes are basically the same as the ones in uh, between QCD or N equals four, because there is no matter at all. So, so the uh, QCD amplitudes inherit all, this, all of the consequences of N equals four supersymmetry. And uh, that, that includes the fact that all the uh, helicity amplitudes with only zero or one negative helicity vanish. And the uh, so-called Park-Taylor amplitudes have a very simple structure that's independent of, of the location of the uh, negative helicities and so on. But at the loop level, there's a big difference between the theories, so they're not going to be very uh, closely related, but they do have some pieces in common. For example, if you, uh, uh, you can show that in N equals four super Yang mills, because of the better uh, behavior in the, uh, of the loop momentum in the numerator, all, only scalar box integrals survive. The lower point integrals like triangles and bubbles disappear. And in fact, all the amplitudes that have been calculated so far in N equals four super Yang mills have at one loop been just weight two functions, exactly weight two. Where, so that, uh, for example, there's a box integral that appears in the glue glue to Higgs glue at one loop, which has this formula in terms of dialogues and logarithms, but it has exactly two logarithms here and one dialog. Whereas the QCD results have this more complicated structure with complicated rational parts and also integrals that involve uh, triangles and bubbles and give things of lower transcendentality like <laughs> rational terms and, and logarithms. So when we focus on the n equals four case, we find that the answer has uniform weight. So at each order, loop order L, we find that the functions have uh, two L non-trivial integrations. And uh, as an example of such functions, <coughs> we'll see a lot more later, but we have logarithms and a logarithm is just the integral of a rational function dt over t, or of course, d log t. The dialogarithm 
which we saw earlier can be written as the integral over two d logs. You first integrate dt over one minus t to get the logarithm, and then you integrate d log t to get the dilogarithm. And then there's also n fold classical polylogs, which are obtained by integrating up uh, the uh, n minus one polylog one more time, and those have weight n. There are many more functions that we'll encounter at weight n, but the classical polylog is just one example. And the general situation, although we haven't calculated it to do too many loops, is that the QCD amplitudes typically populate all of the possible weights from this maximal weight of 2L down to zero, that is rational terms, whereas the n equals four ones are just uniform, just sitting at 2L. Now, there's this very nice picture for n equals four superhang mills, which was pioneered by work by people in this room, Mike Juan and Ed and Gobser, Klebanoff and Polyakov of the uh, picture that a conformal field theory and this theory N equals four super Yang Mills is really the prototype can be interpreted as a, a graph theory of gravity or a string theory moving in ADS five process five in this case. And uh, this is uh, an example of a weak strong duality. So if you try to calculate the gluon amplitudes order by order in perturbation theory, like you might do in QCD, that's a very difficult problem on the other side. But if you want to go all the way to strong yang mills coupling, especially at large n, you can do the calculation of weak coupling on the gravity side. And uh, there's also a T-duality symmetry of string theory that was recognized by Fernando Alda and Juan. And uh, that one, comes from the fact that the string world sheet variables can be interchanged. And so if you have a, a string where you have a, a center of mass motion by a momentum K, normally you would attribute that to the world sheet time coordinate. And, uh, <clears throat> but you can also think of it in this T dual frame as being associated with the world sheet space coordinate. And in that case, for an open string, the ends of the two strings now get separated by a light-like distance, where k is the light-like momentum of the of the gluon that you're describing. When you put that together, you get this very nice picture in the strong coupling limit of planar n equals four with a semi-classical uh, picture in string theory. So the kinematics of the scattering process, this closed light-like polygon illustrated here, is uh, then the boundary conditions for a minimal area problem in ADS space. And the solution may look something like this. There's a, a minimal area surface. But the important thing is that the boundary is determined by a light-like closed polygon. And that suggested that one also look for this duality of weak coupling. And it was found that <coughs> even a weak coupling where you can achieve these Wilson loops uh, perturbatively in the coupling. In every case that was computed, they were found to be exactly uh, equivalent to calculating loops for scattering amplitudes with Feynman diagrams with gluons extending to infinity. So that's a pretty remarkable uh, relation. And it tells us that the, the essential uh, dependence of these space-time amplitudes is not on all of the arbitrary momentum invariants or Mandelstam variables you might write down, but it only depends on, uh, on the corners of these polygons up to a symmetry, a conformal symmetry in terms of the X's, which is uh, also called dual conformal symmetry. So this dual conformal symmetry maps these coordinates. One of, one of its consequences is that it should be invariant under inversion. And so a coordinate X is uh, sent to X over XI squared, and when you do that, the invariant xi squared goes back into itself up to these factors. But in order for a kinematic variable to be completely invariant under this transformation, you need to uh, form these invariant cross ratios. And these xi squareds, or the uh, difference between two adjacent x's is a momentum. The difference between two x's that are further apart is a sum of adjacent momenta. 
squared or, or a Mandelstam variable for these uh, separations. So, so you now have a reduction in the number of degrees of freedom for the scattering problem by a factor of four for the four generators of special conformal transformations, which are represented by uh, inversions plus uh, translations plus inversions. This symmetry is so strong that it doesn't allow any non-trivial functions for four gluon and five gluon scattering. Because normally, if, you, if these were arbitrary points, x i j squared, you would have the familiar two cross ratios of the four point problem. But now x i i plus one squared is set to be zero because that's the associated with this light-like uh, <coughs> external momentum. So there are no such variables for n equals four and not even for n equals five. In this six point case, you have precisely three ratios allowed, which we call a U, V, and W. Later, we're gonna put hats on them to avoid confusing them with another U, V, and W. But they are made out of ratios of, of these uh, X, I, J differences. Separate by two in the numerator and separate by three in the denominator with the exchange of, of these two internal ones, J and K, which uh, causes invariance under inversion. So here's just a picture of the, the sketch of the one for you. If you put uh, the solid guys in the numerator and the dash guys in the denominator, that gives you a, a dual conformal cross ratio for the six point amplitude or it's dual, the hexagonal Wilson loop. And then the other two just come by symmetry by rotating around the, uh, the uh, point cycling them by one. So we have this nice uh, playground of uh, in the six point case of functions of three non-trivial variables. So we can also go to higher point cases, although the space gets more complicated as we add three variables for each, uh, for each uh, additional leg. So we exploited the simplicity of the, of the uh, kinematics for the six point case, just depending on three variables and some insight about the uh, functions came from work by Anastasia Volovich, Mark Spradlin, Sasha Goncharov, and Christian Bergu. And we, we managed to extend it up to uh, seven loops. Now I'm not gonna say too much about the details of this because the details are very similar to another uh, problem, the problem of determining the form factor. And I'll say more about it there. But the bottom line is that we have a lot of data for amplitudes up to seven loops that we can dig out and test for various uh, properties. And it's a pretty rich uh, region. There are many different uh, kinematic limits to explore. There's uh, one region I mentioned in the earlier talk. I mentioned that there's a self-crossing limit where the hexagon twists down into so it almost looks like two squares with two lines being coming very close to each other. That's this red line here. I also mentioned briefly the multi-regi limit. That's sort of down in this corner here, although it's bigger than it looks because there's really a, a single complex variable that describes the functions down in this region. There's a near collinear limit where we can uh, have boundary data that help us find exactly the right function in this space. So having all that to high loop orders also gives us a lot of data to explore. And one of the <laughs> results of that is to find this uh, duality by, by comparing this to something else. And more generally, inspired by Nima, who I think provided this figure, is that right, Nima? <laughs> we, we would like to uh, kind of have as a, as a goal, solving for these amplitudes in the large end limit for arbitrary atuf coupling and for arbitrary kinematics. At the moment, we have various lines through this space. We have a line out at infinite coupling where we use this minimal surface description. And uh, we have perturbative lines at each order along here. And then we also have orders in the kinematic variable expansion from a flux tube approach, uh, which I don't have time to say a lot about now. But uh, we would like to go further, but for the moment we, we work in perturbation theory 
And the thing we've done more recently is a different problem from the six gluon problem, or at least we thought it was a different problem. And that one involves three gluons that form an operator, which uh, can produce two gluons, one of the representations of a operator supermultiplet. So it's really very similar to the production of glue glue goes to Higgs plus glue in, in QCD. It's just now you should add in super partners everywhere in these graphs. So, so this form factor turns out to be kind of the Goldilocks uh, form factor. It's not too simple and it's not too complicated. The simplest thing we could imagine as a form factor for this amplitude would be to just have two gluons. So it'd be glue glue to Higgs amplitude or Higgs to glue glue decay. But that one turns out to be too simple for the methods we have. The problem is that it has no kinematic dependence at all uh, because of the fact that there's only one overall scale, the mass of the Higgs or the, the momentum squared of the operator or the invariant mass of the two incoming gluons, all of which are just S12. If you only have one scale, you can factor it out. In dimensional regularization, you get a slightly different dimension depending on the loop order, but everything else is just pure numbers. And the way we need to uh, work is to find a function space that we can move around in and incorporate information from different kinematic regions. So this, this process is just too simple. But the one with three gluons is just right. It only depends on two dimensionless ratios, which makes it even simpler than the six gluon scattering amplitude. And having been able to go to eight loops, which we just wrote up the results this past week, allowed us to find this uh, earlier announced result uh, about a duality between this amplitude and the six gluon amplitude. So just a little brief word about the kinematics of this process. Um, <clears throat> you can consider it in various channels. I mentioned glue glue to Higgs glue, but we can also have Higgs decay to three gluons, or uh, we can also consider the Higgs if it's just an, representing an operator, we could take it to have space-like momenta. But in all of those channels, it inhabits this uh, two-dimensional plane which I've labeled by U and V, where U is the ratio of S12 to S123, and V is the ratio of S23 to S123. Now there's also an invariant S31, but it's not independent of S12 and S23 because the sum of the three of them is also by momentum conservation. Uh, if you square it up, it gives you the operator mass squared or M Higgs squared. So if we divide this equation here, by S123, we see that there is a third dummy variable around W, but the three just add up to one. However, it's useful to keep W in the game because there is a dihedral symmetry uh, where we cycle U to V to W to U, or we can flip U and V, and it's more manifest if we keep W around. So this is the line W equals zero, U equals zero, V equals zero, and these lines divide a decay region, which is Euclidean or pseudo Euclidean from scattering regions. So this is the region one, which is Euclidean. And then we have regions two and three, which are scattering depending on whether it's space-like or time-like. And this three gluon form factor is a super amplitude, but the core part of it is invariant under uh, this dihedral symmetry. So I mentioned before that at one loop, we get some of these uh, integrals that are dialogarithms. Since their arguments only involve dimensionless ratios, they should only depend on, on U and V. So they look something like that. Now at two loops, this story goes back about 10 years when this uh, amplitude was computed in, in QCD by Thomas German, Matthias Jacquier, Nigel Glover, and Kukutsakis. And uh, they found a fairly intricate expression. As I mentioned, it has all different weights going from weight four down to rational. But then just after that, uh, Brand Huber, Travellini, and Young computed the, the stress tensor three-point form factor, the same quantity we're talking about, 
in n equals four super yang mills. And remarkably, the, the highest weight part of the QCD result was exactly the same as the n equals four result. Now, this kind of agreement between the maximal transcendental parts had been seen before, but uh, and uh, so it was sort of called the principle of maximal transcendentality, but it was seen more in uh, anomalous dimensions or infinite sets of anomalous dimensions, like in the D-glab kernels, the twist two anomalous dimension. And that infinite set is sort of like a one parameter function. But in this case, it also holds for a, a two, uh, two parameter function. One interesting question is whether this holds beyond two loops because we don't really have a firm argument why it has to hold in this case. And, uh, but in order to do that, we'll need the three loop results from QCD as well as from planar n equals four. Anyway, uh, this result was rather intriguing. And by looking at it, you can get a pretty good idea of what the space of functions, at least some super space, super set of the space of functions is supposed to look like. So, uh, German and Ramiti worked out all of the uh, required uh, Feynman integrals, and they found that they were what they called 2D harmonic polylogs. But we, they also fall into this category of generalized polylogarithms. And you can define them by iterated integration, but you can also define them differentially. So if you take these functions and differentiate with respect to U or V, you find a very uniform structure where the coefficients f with superscripts are all uh, 2D HPLs of one weight lower. And again, W is not really an independent variable. So you have this very constrained uh, differential structure. And so the idea is to bootstrap this uh, amplitude to beyond two loops. We wanna find a subspace that, in, that, is, that contains the amplitude in question, but also lives within the space of 2D HPLs. And uh, the smaller a subspace we find, the higher a loop order we can go to. So just a little bit more sort of general formalism. Um, these generalized polylogarithms uh, have been introduced and studied uh, by mathematicians Chen, Goncharov, and Brown. And they can be defined as iterated integrals where instead of just integrating dt over t all the time, like we do for the classical polylogs, we allow it to be t minus a1, where this could be some function of the kinematics as well as x. But a, a little simpler way to define these guys, at least in part, is to define them differentially. So we take the derivative of f, and we find that when you have a structure like this, you typically get, you get a sum over a finite number of d logs of some quantity s k, which we call the letters in a symbol alphabet. And so there's sort of a uniform function space where all the derivatives have a very standard structure, like we saw in the uh, 2D HPL example. Furthermore, there's a mathematical uh, uh, <coughs> action of a Hopf algebra that coax on the space of polylogs. An action is an example of taking a, say the product of two functions and returning a single function. And this sort of goes in the reverse direction. It splits up functions into simpler functions. And, and one example of this coaction, which is really all the, the only one we're gonna need for the most part, is that the derivative is one piece of delta. So you take this differential form and you represent it in this kind of notation of a tensor product where the coefficients of the derivatives, these n minus one weight functions are tensored with the uh, d log where we drop the, the d over here. And so this, this is really, it has all the same information in it as the derivative, but we also refer to it as the n minus one comma one common one co-product of F. And this uh, is just taking the first derivative, but because these lower weight functions belong in to the same space, we can keep iterating and uh, take derivatives of an FSJ, expand it over these symbols and so on. So we keep taking 
further derivatives or technically further multiple co-products. And the maximal iteration, if you have a weight n function, is to do this n times until you can no longer take derivatives anymore. And that gives rise to this symbol, which was introduced to the, in this, this paper by Goncharov, Spradlin, Burgu, and Volovich. And when, once you've reached the symbol, you've differentiated n times, and these are just rational numbers. In some cases, they're just integers. Really simple, except that it's a very uh, big object. Just as a quick example, if you've never seen the, this notion of the symbol before, we discussed these classical polylogs before, which are defined in the integral form as the integral dt over t of the previous one. And the first one, sometimes called li1, and it's minus the log of one minus x. You all know this has a simple uh, power series expansion, which converges anywhere for x less than one, and it has a branch cut starting at x equals one. When you do these integrals, you see a series that has the same radius of convergence and the branch cut starts in exactly the same place, which is not surprising because you're integrating over something that has a branch cut starting at x equals one. And because of this, because of the sort of commutativity between differentiation and branch cuts, we learn a lot about the branch cuts uh, from the symbol. Now here's the symbol of lin of x. We know that its derivative is lin minus one times d log of x. We go back to our formula for the uh, symbol for the first action, where we put the d log in the back and just take the d off of it. So we should put a log x here, except when we go to the symbol, we have the convention of just deleting the logarithm part. So we should put tensor x in the back and then put the symbol of lin minus one in the front. And if we keep iterating this procedure, we'll keep differentiating this and it will keep giving us d log x's, which just give us tensor x's in the back. And then at the end of the day, we hit a logarithm li1, which is a uh, log of one minus x. So this is the symbol of li n of x. But you'll see it, that it has different properties in the front and the back. The front tells you where the branch cut discontinuities are. So when this thing goes to zero, that tells you there's a discontinuity at x equals one, the singularities of that initial logarithm. Whereas the back is all about the derivatives, tells you uh, what's going on there. So there's a fundamental difference between the front and the back of the symbol. There's a generalization of the uh, classical polylogs called the HPLs or harmonic polylogs in one variable that were worked out or defined by Remedia and Vermazarin. And they involve integrating dt over t and dt over one minus t. And uh, they're kind of a vast uh, generalization of the classical polylogs kind of operating in the same space, things that depend on x. When you look at their derivatives, you see you have d log x and d log one minus x. And so the symbol alphabet is x one minus x. But you can actually get an x or one minus x in each slot in contrast to the classical polylogs, which have only one minus x in the first slot. And thereafter you just get x. If you can put either one in there, you have a huge number of functions. You have a binary choice at each step. And so you have two to the two L such uh, functions. And once again, as in the classical polylog case, the branch cuts are dictated by the first entry and the derivative by the last entry. Now let's go back to the case we wanted to look at and put it into this formalism. If we look at these derivatives of these functions, and identify it with this total differential, we see that the things that appear are d logs of these six objects, u, v, w, one minus u, one minus v, one minus w. And uh, <clears throat> so all the 2D HPLs live in the space of functions or generalized polylogarithms with this simple alphabet. For example, this function here, if you uh, go through and take its derivative and calculate the symbol from it, you find that it has a u tensor one minus u and a v tensor one minus v. And then the, the cross terms come from the minus log of uh, u times log of v. But uh, all the functions will live inside the space defined by these simple letters. But with 
a lot more restrictions, it turns out. Anyway, this is just some heuristic view of what the function space looks like that we bootstrap in. We start with the function one. We put in some logarithms here. You'll notice we don't put any logs of one minus u. Those give us unphysical branch cuts. So we have to start with just three functions at this weight. And then we start building up higher functions. There's some conditions to impose from integrability and so on. And if we were to do the same thing for the n-gluon amplitudes, at n equals six, we would have uh, nine letters, uh, which are shown here. And now I've put hats on them. They involve the cross ratios, one minus the cross ratios, some parity odd letters. In n equals seven, we have 42 letters. At n equals eight, it's still not completely clear how many letters we have. There are at least 222 letters from a recent three loop paper, but I don't know if we're completely sure that there's a finite number of letters. Fortunately, we're gonna leave all this stuff aside and focus on n equals six for the rest of the talk. If you're at all interested in the gory details, even gorier than this, you can uh, go watch some uh, lectures at the Amplitude Games from last year. Now let's go back to that three gluon form factor. We uh, found it useful to change to an equivalent alphabet. Before I mentioned that the alphabet was U, V, W, one minus U, one minus V, one minus W, but there's nothing to stop us from making a multiplicative change of variables to six different quantities, these ratios and these ratios. And when we do that, we find that the symbols of the three loop form factor simplify remarkably at one and two loops. In fact, the one loop answer is a single term, uh, which has a V in the front and a D in the back, plus uh, dihedral images. And the dihedral group has six elements to it, generated by cycles and flips. And so we get six, <coughs> six terms in all. And then the uh, two loop one is actually still extremely simple. It has only two distinct terms plus their dihedral images. We can actually simplify things even more if we take a kinematic limit, which is sort of how we found this duality in the first place. We took the limit V to infinity. If you look at this simple alphabet here, and you take V to infinity, you'll see, and you remember what W is, one minus U minus V, you'll see that the only simple letters you're left with are uh, one over U and one minus one over U, or U and one minus U if you prefer. And because of that, we know the answer has to collapse to harmonic polylogs in, uh, with just zeros and ones in front and one minus one over u is the argument. So we wrote them down and uh, by eight loops, we didn't quite write that down in tech and has 16,384 terms. And then we remembered the six gluon case that we had found a place where it simplified a lot too. And that was for these uh, hatted variables, the three coordinates being one and these two being equal. And in that case, the answer looked like this. And some of those numbers look kind of familiar. If you go back and forth and you delete everything with a zeta two in it, you'll see that like here, this 96, zero, one, 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 and this 96 with a bunch of zeros and ones, you can exactly map these guys into each other. Uh, and the symbol level essentially means ignore all the zetas. If you just make this kinematic map, which effectively flops the zeros and ones in these HPLs to switch to one minus. If you also reverse the order of the symbol entries. So we tried that out seven loops and we found that 4,096 terms agreed. Now this was just on a one dimensional slice. Then, then we realized that the uh, full statement involves a, the full two dimensional kinematics of the form factor it maps to the uh, dual of the six gluon amplitude when we're on a particular kinematic slice. So these hatted variables have to be related to the unhatted variables in this way. And if you plug this in and you impose U plus V plus W equals one, you'll find that the U hat, V hat, and W hat uh, obey this relation. They're constrained by this uh, determinant. 
We'll come back to that determinant in a second, but let me just mention that besides the kinematic map, there's also the antipode map. This is a, <clears throat> essentially like an inverse operation in a, in a uh, Galois group, uh, but it's just defined by the mathematicians. And at the symbol level, all it does is reverse the order of all of the letters and writes them backwards up to some overall minus one to the M, which doesn't matter for us because M is always even for these uh, symbol, the symbols of these amplitudes. So the instructions are apply this kinematic map and see what it does to the symbol letters and then reverse them all. And you'll get the, you'll go from the six gluon amplitude to the three gluon form back. Or you can apply S squared as one, so you can apply S on the other side, go back and forth. So this constraint here may look a little weird, but it actually just corresponds, it's a grand determinant that corresponds to putting the six momenta into a smaller substance. And in fact, we can reach it by uh, doing uh, some kind of twisted forward scattering. So we have the six gluons that are ordered around the loop. And we take the diagonally opposite gluons and assign them negative momenta. In this way, instead of having six independent or five independent momenta, we have three independent momenta, which is similar to what happens in the form factor. We don't, we don't know for sure what this means just yet, but uh, it's one way of interpreting this, this uh, parity preserving surface. So when we do this map and we go onto this surface, I mentioned before that we had nine letters for the in the bulk in the three dimensional kinematics, but when we go onto the surface because it preserves parity and these guys are parity odd, they all go to one, which means we just delete them whenever in any term of the symbol that has them. And then we also uh, make the same substitution away from U V W hat to A B C D E F hat. Once we do that, then the kinematic map on the letters becomes this simple swap from A hat to D, but with a square root here, and from D hat to A, plus uh, cyclic images of these relations. So this tells us exactly how to substitute the symbol. If you take the one loop symbol I showed you earlier uh, for the three point form factor, apply these rules and reverse the order, you get this symbol, which is exactly the symbol of the uh, one loop answer. When you do it at two loops, you get this result, which is exactly the symbol of the two loop answer once you drop on this surface. And in general, this is the number of terms in the symbol on either side of the duality up through seven loops, which is as far as we've gone so far on the, on the six gluon side. And all 92,954,568 non-vanishing terms have the same closure. So, so we're kind of situated, even though we don't understand where this is coming from. This kinemap, kinematic map is kind of interesting. It, uh, this is the surface delta equals zero illustrated. It's kind of like a tetrahedron. If you take a tetrahedron, put a little straw into a corner and puff and blow it up a little bit, that's, that's more or less what this looks like. And this delta equals zero tetrahedron gets mapped over to this part of the UV uh, w, UV plane. There are white regions in here. They're also covered by the map. We just didn't bother showing them, uh, but they come out to larger values of U hat, V hat, and W hat. One of the more interesting things about the dual kinematic map is that a soft uh, collinear limit over here, this green line or this blue line is a collinear limit or this orange line. And, and uh, the uh, blue line uh, kind of maps into this corner here. And the uh, green line maps down into this corner. And these are soft limits. So soft limits map to collinear limits and collinear limits map to soft limits. <clears throat> we can check this duality beyond the symbol level uh, by going to special points. There are many special points in this space where the amplitudes evaluate to uh, numbers in a special space. Uh, different spaces depending on the point. The simplest case to consider is like this black point here, 111. It maps out to infinity. And at this point, the answer is always uh, multiple zeta values, various uh, nested sums. Sometimes you get alternating sums at some of these points. At other points, you get uh, six roots of unity. 
But in all such points, you can actually find a way of representing the numbers to make the coaction manifest, as was pointed out by Francis Brown and encoded into a Maple program by Oliver Schnetz. So we can actually represent all the numbers in this way and see what we get. Here, I'll just show you the simplest point. And uh, that was the point 111, which maps out to infinity. At this point, nothing interesting happens until four loops. So you have to go a little ways to see things sometimes. <laughs> but at four loops, when we represent numbers in this uh, space, they involve even Riemann zeta values, which are powers of even powers of pi, powers of pi squared. But then they start to uh, develop dependence on, <coughs> on some non-abelian words in an F alphabet. And the main thing I want you to uh, notice without going into too many details is that the antipodal map beyond the symbol level also includes an instruction to reverse the order of the letters in these words. And so you see here, there's a, uh, zeta, a, a F35, and here you have an F53, and they have the same coefficient in blue. When you go to five loops, you have uh, an F37 and an F73 and an F55, and the coefficients uh, completely map back and forth. And similarly at six and seven loops. But this all only works up to pi squared terms. And all of these zeta values here are multiples of pi squared. And more generally, uh, there are other points where things are also messed up by a single pi, which always comes with an i. And this is sort of a fundamental feature of this uh, coaction on which this uh, antipode is based, is that it's only defined mod i pi on one side. And since we're trying to switch the two sides, at least the mathematicians don't give us any instruction what to do about the i pi terms. So maybe there's a way to understand what's going on with the i pi terms. But for now, we have to say that this, uh, this antipodal symmetry map is only uh, sort of mod i pi. So I think in view of the hour, I won't say too much about this, but there is a, uh, a flux tube picture that sits at the boundary to both the six gluons gluon amplitude and the uh, and the three gluon form factor, and it's actually very important for boundary conditions for for bootstrapping. And uh, the main thing I want you to take away from it is that there's sort of a natural kinematic map that was described that was used by Vaso, Sever, and Vieira to describe the kinematics on both sides. And this antipodal duality map looks very simple in terms of that, uh, in terms of those variables. But more generally, you can expand the S matrix in the number of flux tube uh, excitations of the flux tube that goes between the edges of these Wilson lines and get this uh, kinematic expansion in principle of finite coupling. So, <clears throat> There was a new form factor version of it, which is very similar. The main difference is that there's one new uh, sort of world sheet ingredient, uh, a form factor transition that, it, that is needed as well. But fortunately for us, that was worked out by Sever, Tumanoff, and Wilhelm over the past two years. So you have representations, which I'm just saying, very, giving very schematically, here, I just want you to notice that they depend on, on some coordinates, which are not the U, V, and W of the, or U hat, V hat, and W hat, but involve tau, sigma, and phi, or their exponentials, which are T, S, and F. And in the three gluon form factor, there is no azimuthal angle, but there's just tau and sigma. So if you plug in, these calculate the cross ratios in terms of these variables, where we put hats on for the amplitude side and no hats for the form factor side. The first thing to say is that this parity preserving kinematics has F hat equal to one. And then if you apply the kinematic map, you see that the relation between the coordinates on the six gluon side in hats and the form factor side is extremely simple. 
It's just that T hat is T over S and S hat is one over ST. You can also invert this relation and it looks exactly the same, except there's some square roots. So this map kind of realizes uh, the duality between soft and collinear limits, but it seems to be telling us a lot more that there's some kind of correspondence going on between single flux tube excitations for the amplitudes, which go like T to the one, and maybe double or bound state excitations of the form factor. But that's like one possible clue that's, ex that's behind this duality. Now, just as one last word, we, we've also looked at the eight gluon amplitude and tried to map it to the four gluon form factor. And uh, we have a candidate kinematic map for it, but not in the full phase <coughs> space of the form factor in a one smaller dimensional uh, subspace. And uh, Simone provided about a decade ago, the symbol of the eight gluon uh, MHV amplitude. And so we can apply the map and see if it works. And uh, we're, we're exploring that right now. And we don't know for sure if, if it's really uh, the right function or exactly uh, what we're supposed to do. But at least the kinematic map turns out to be, again, very simple in these uh, kind of flux tube inspired coordinates. It's just a kind of double copy of the, uh, of the same uh, structure we had before, where some T hatted is T over S and S hat is a one over TS. And also the surface that we're on down here has a F2 fixed, but strangely it's, not, it's fixed to uh, I rather than, than uh, one. So I'll just wrap up by saying that Thanks to the simplicity of these particular uh, function spaces and a planar n equals four, we've been able to calculate two separate quantities to at least seven loops. And very strangely to us, they seem to be almost the same thing, but written backwards, at least if you collapse onto the right surface. So we've never really seen the, uh, because of this strange role of <coughs> swapping branch cuts and derivatives, this, Duality seems very strange to us. We don't really know what it means. Looking for clues. We can, one thing we could look at is how it holds its strong coupling. There are strong coupling prescriptions. We don't know what mod I phi is supposed to mean in strong coupling, but comparing the, the surfaces that are mapped into each other under this duality should be interested, interesting to do. We don't know yet for sure if it holds at the state four level or beyond. And then there's a question of how much of this we can exploit, exploit to learn more about both amplitudes and form factors, and also whether it extends out of this very special theory we found in it. Thanks a lot. Any questions for Mike? How much you think about what the, what uh, what the antipode looks like at strong coupling. I mean, you don't get, you're not going to get pure. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you're, you're kind of going to have to look at the configurations and understand with the TDA equations, uh, how they map into each other. I haven't really looked at it myself, but it's going to be more uh, tilde involved <laughs> because we have this, uh, you know, I pi ambiguity. So you can't like look at something numerical. And even if you could, you don't, the numerical, uh, the antipodal duality doesn't mean that the numerical value is the same, even if the uh, functions are interchanged. By the way, we did uh, look at uh, something. We, we can look at the, So this is a plot of the answer in the Euclidean region on both sides. And the variable U is from the form factor side, but we can map it to the to a to, you know map back to see where it is on the other side. And this this line segment, U going from zero to a half, it run down, runs down the midpoint of that triangle. And either end is on a soft collinear limit. And in that region, and that re those points alone, we we have the I pi's under control, uh, basically because we kind of rigged the normalization of the thing we were talking about so that it matches at one loop. 
And once it matches at one loop, the L loop amplitudes have to behave like e to the one loop amplitude. So, uh, so the ratio has to be one at the endpoint. But then we can ask, how does this, you know, antipodal duality, et cetera, or whatever it means beyond I pi, how does it actually affect the numerical answer? And the answer is that it, uh, it, through eight loops, it's good to at least, or seven loops, it's good to 1.6. So 1.6 doesn't sound so great, but each loop order is changing by, uh, and the normalization we use a factor of 10 or more. So it still seems kind of uh, amazing, but uh, that, that it doesn't differ by more. But that's uh, like all we can say about something uh, numerical and weak components. Any other questions for Lance? David? Do you expect that there's a fancier version of this that does take into account the IPIs that would just be a true duality? Yeah, we're not sure. Um, so uh, one of the issues is what you're supposed to do. If we go back to that map at through the bulk, we can point out a kind of problem with or or potential problems with trying to solve all the I pi issues. And uh, so, like. Uh, uh, <laughs> So this is the Euclidean region. So there are no IPIs at all here. And uh, we could map it to a Euclidean region in these variables. But uh, then if we start to continue out into this region, say, we get into a region that has IPIs <coughs> here. At least we don't know any other way to do it than by uh, taking U and V to be negative, and then we generate IPIs. So then we have to ask, but this side here could be in the Euclidean region, and in both cases, it could also be in a, uh, a physical scattering region. We don't want it to be in the physical scattering region here because this is real, so we want this to be real. And then as we come around here, well, we could move on to a physical scattering sheet and generate IPIs, but, but then we can come to this self-crossing point that I mentioned in the last talk, and there the IPIs actually diverge logarithmically at a point where we're not supposed to, we don't get any divergences on the other side. So we, we have a, uh, some uh, fundamental misunderstanding of what we're supposed to do if there's supposed to be a way to fix the I prime. So that, that's where we're at now. But in particular, in trying to compare numerics, you, you also tried just flipping the signs, uh, I guess, of uh, doing the there, 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 there's a question whether the IPI ambiguity, I, even yeah. the one you're talking about, is something that you can get by sort of everywhere you see a U replacing it with a minus U, or whether you have to do it in, in a particular entrance, which would, which would be. Uh, yeah, well, we, ha we haven't tried all possible <laughs> ways to fix it up. So it's possible something about which direction you continue is uh, the issue. We're not sure. Okay. Also, it should be uh, another important thing is. We divide it out by some divergent quantity in both cases. There are IPIs in that divergent quantity. And uh, the divergent quantity always has the cusp and almost mentioned in it. So it's possible that if we take feed down of, of uh, lower loop amplitudes multiplied by cusp and almost dimension multiplied by IPIs from continuing logarithms, that something like that will work. And then we just missed it because we. We, we forgot about the prefactor we divided by. So uh, we probably should take a, a longer look at this. Well, somebody else can. What, what happens if you try to deform away from n equals four? Is there something like this in the fishnet theory, for example? Um, yeah, there's a good question about whether you asked whether it might apply in fishnet theory. I mean, the simplest example is related to something that Nima did. The one loop fishnet theory is, is a one loop off shell box diagram. And Nima and Ellis studied one loop integrals. And they found a curious 
uh, anapodal relation at one loop where you reverse the letters, but it maps you to a different <laughs> integral where you invert the matrix that appears between the Feynman parameters. And it seems to take you out of this space of functions in the sense that it seems to move you from massless internal lines to massive internal lines. So that doesn't uh, seem to work too well. But there is something very curious about fishnet type integrals. If we go from this one loop example, and then we go to the ladders, you can take the ladder integrals and you can start taking derivatives of them and you can count how many independent functions you have. So the ladder integral at L loops is weight 2L, you have one function. And then you find there's two independent derivatives. And by the way, it's a, it has a first entry condition too that says there's two independent weight one function. So you have one here, two here, three here, four here. So the dimensions look like you might be able to do this swap, but it doesn't look like you can do it. It's not self-dual. Maybe it's dual to something else, we don't know, but it's not self-dual. But it's kind of funny because we, we've studied analogs of these ladders with, so not just having massive legs on each side, but you could replace that box with two masses with a massless pentagon on one side or on the other side. And they all have this uh, palindromic property that the dimensions can be reversed. But we don't, but you can show that there's like no way to map them into each other. We don't know if they map somewhere else, but it's certainly something interesting to try. But this is a, it's a feature of like maybe the most geometric way of defining polylogarithms, the, the Aomoto way of defining polylogarithms. You take an uh, integral of some, some canonical form for a polytope one integrated over polytope two. And, uh, and if you reverse the meaning of the polytope, you reverse the letters in the center. So that's, uh, so that's, that's one basic origin of this kind of uh, antipodal duality. No idea. What, oh, first of all, the, something literally like that is obviously not, 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 going on, uh, not going on here. But it does happen. It's not a completely obvious fact, but it becomes sort of more obvious when you, uh, when you recognize that canonical forms of polytopes are volumes of dual. So, so there is a sort of a trivial duality behind, not that trivial. There is a, there is a, there is a, there is a duality behind it there. There is a presentation that makes it obvious, but when you integrate over one polytope to get a canonical form for another one, you break, you break the symmetry and then it looks like a mysterious uh, uh, fact. But there is a presentation that's manifestly duality in there. Makes, makes the expedal duality obvious. So when we are working out <laughs> empirically, the rules for what letters can appear next to reflect in the form factor space, you didn't have a good causal argument for it. You didn't have the Steiner relation because we need these three particle invariants in the massless case, and we didn't have them. So we just used them empirically. Now, now they can be justified if you buy the duality because they map under the duality to conditions that do come from causality from the Steiner relation. But uh, some of those conditions are also obeyed by the entire set of integrals that German and company computed back uh, in a decade ago. Not all of them, but some of them. So it's a question of <clears throat> the direction of trying to go beyond n equals four to understand why those uh, have some of these adjacency conditions holding in them. Also, now people are producing these integrals, the same kinematics, but at three loops. And uh, it's time to check how much they, they hold uh, at three loops. And some of that's starting to be checked, but not everything yet. Because they don't have a great causal reason from our point of view. Yeah, Julio? Yeah, so in n equals four, you have this last entry condition for the amplitude. Yeah. But the first entry is something that should be true for any integral or any theory, right? So Yeah, one thing I didn't emphasize is <clears throat> the last entry for MHB, six gluon, correctly maps to the causal first entry for the form fact. But the six gluon amplitude also has an NMHB configuration, and we have no idea what to do with it. It doesn't map properly because it has a different final entry 
So it doesn't map to the right first entry. I mean, we use that condition at the eight one four one form factor to hone in on the map without knowing what it was from the beginning. We had to take the last entries of Simone's formula and map them to the first entries of the four gluon form factor. But we knew there are eight of those. So we had to find a subspace because Simone's formula has more than eight. So we had to find a subspace that uh, map that dropped that down into eight. And then we could map it over to the other side. But we're still not completely sure that this map is giving us a sensible uh, form factor. It's close, but there's some twos that are a little bit wonky. Any other questions for Lance? All right, if not, let's thank him again for beautiful talk. <laughs>